I have a question for you. What ruins your metabolism more? Is it dieting or stress? Today, we're going to find out. Now, this topic is interesting, especially if you have a problem losing weight or you get stuck or you have a plateau. The question is, what do you focus on? What do you do so you're not spinning your wheels and you can get some major results? There are various factors involved. We have current dieting and past dieting. You have your stress level. You have your sleep. You have your age, right? Well, which you can't really do anything about. You have what you eat, carbohydrates, for example, proteins, fats. You might have this idea that maybe you need to eat uh, smaller meals, uh, frequent meals to stimulate your metabolism. Then you have exercise. Do you exercise more? Or maybe you start eating healthier. What do you do? And what has the biggest impact on your metabolism? Well, I have some interesting news for you. And you might want to be sitting down for this, okay? Your metabolism is not ruined. Your metabolism is not damaged or destroyed. These things right here do not ruin your metabolism. They actually make your metabolism more efficient. In fact, if you are overweight, you should get a t-shirt. I'm not overweight. I'm just more efficient. It sounds a lot better. Let me explain what I mean. You have some people that can burn fat very easily and without much effort, really. And you need other people that, boy, they, they have to do extreme things to be able to burn fat. And what's really happening at the cellular level is that their fat cells are very, very efficient at um, releasing energy. Fat cells do not like to waste energy. So what is the solution? Well, to make your body waste more fat. And as a little side note, what's interesting about the ketogenic diet is that you're wasting a lot of fat. Not only are you primarily burning fat, you're peeing out excessive ketones and you're even breathing out your fat. That's why you can test ketones through um, your breath and your urine. So what is being efficient? Well, your energy system, your fat cells, and this is just a survival mechanism, really. What controls this? You guessed it, insulin, okay? The pancreas makes insulin. Insulin's job is to store energy, store calories. It's a fat storing hormone when it's high. When the insulin is low, the body then can burn fat, okay? So if the insulin is high, you can't burn fat, only when it's low. So the idea is to keep insulin very low. We've got the pancreas that makes insulin, little cell called the beta cell here. And what happens over time is when the insulin is too high repetitively, then your body starts rejecting it and it starts to become more efficient by causing a um, resistance to that receptor. The problem is we don't get this return communication back to the pancreas. So we don't get the message back to the pancreas that there's a problem, there's a blockage. And so the pancreas just goes, okay, well, I'm just going to produce more. So the pancreas is being ignored. So it just keeps communicating more and more and more. And we have a situation where we have both insulin resistance and too much insulin. Okay. And with this message being so high, your body is just like not going to burn fat. And when it holds fat, it's being very, very conservative and very efficient. So really the problem is an alteration in the endocrine system. Okay. Now, before I get into these items here, I just need to explain something, okay? This is interesting. Let's just talk about diabetes for a second. We have diabetes, we have prediabetes, and then before that, you have insulin resistance. So in order to get prediabetes, okay, you have to first have insulin resistance. And with insulin resistance, we have this, this compensation going on because think about it, the messages aren't getting through so then the body has to make more insulin to make up for the resistance. So that's to compensate, okay? So with prediabetes, we're getting less compensation. So now this compensation mechanism is, is failing to a certain degree. So now if we have less insulin being pumped out, okay, we have less control of blood sugars. So now the blood sugars have no choice, but they're starting to go up. 
because one of the functions of insulin is to take the sugar out of the blood and turn it into fat, right? So what happens is we don't have as much of that. And so now we're getting higher sugars, okay? So they're gonna diagnose you as a pre-diabetic. And then over time, you become a diabetic. Now we have even less compensation. We have even less insulin there. So we have higher and higher levels of blood sugar, okay? So that's really what happens with diabetes. Now, normally when you get insulin resistance, you don't have the symptom of high blood sugar, right? Your blood sugars are normal, regardless of how much sugar you eat. Why? Because insulin is working like crazy to remove that sugar. And unfortunately, the doctors are only focused on the blood sugars and not the insulin levels. You don't go to the doctor and get your insulin level tested, because if you did, it'd be off the charts. You see that test, if done right here, could make you aware of where you are, so you never go into these two things right here. But with insulin resistance, you don't have any symptoms of high blood sugar, okay? You do have other symptoms, obesity. Why? Because of the relationship between insulin and your fat, right? You also have high cholesterol, high triglycerides, you might have um, low HDL and high LDL, and you might have high blood pressure, and there's a whole series of other symptoms you might have. Now, when things get worse, okay, and let's say you're in this mode, you might get really thirsty, you might have frequent urination, you might get really tired after you eat, uh, you can have more of a fatty liver. Now, the way they diagnose this is they use an A1C. What is an A1C test? It basically measures how much sugar that is stuck to your blood cells, you know, the protein in your blood, okay? So that's really what it, what it tells us. And it kind of gives you a measurement of how much sugar is in your bloodstream, okay? Because if you look up obesity, diabetes, this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, um, yes, what causes this problem is, is definitely related to lifestyle and genetics, but it's still unclear what is the actual causative factor, right? I mean, now to me, I'm like, are these people just completely ignorant or are they trying to cover something up or what? It just doesn't make sense because basically a test is tell us how much sugar is in your bloodstream. So obviously this relates to diet, right? Uh, or other things that can affect the sugar in the blood. I mean, it's just bizarre to me if we look at what they say about this relationship between cause and effect. They will tell you that there are risk factors involved, okay? And that's, you know, they might say lack of sleep, stress, carbohydrates, things like that, but they won't come out and say the actual causative factor, okay? So that's interesting. Now, let's just talk about these factors that could ruin your metabolism, or shall I say, make your metabolism efficient. Well, we have poor sleep, right? We have stress level. We have dieting, we have frequent meals, inactivity, all these different things here. Let's start with sleep. So if you're not sleeping, um, you'll notice that you will be hungry the next day, right? Your appetite will go up. You will want to snack. Now, there's a couple of reasons why. One is there's an there's alteration in hormones. Um, you might be tired and you're trying to eat to get energy. There's also a spike in cortisol. There's also a spike in insulin. And all these hormones can not just make you fat, but can make you hungry all the time as well. So they found in one study that just one night of poor sleep can increase the problem of insulin resistance, okay, to a significant degree. And the risk factors of becoming a diabetic, if you're sleeping five hours or less, is by 3x, okay? You're 3x more likely to get diabetes if your sleep is less than five hours, okay? So that's, that's significant. All right, let's talk about stress. What does stress do? Well, you have the stress hormone called cortisol. Another name for that is glucocorticoids, okay? So stress increases not just glucocorticoids, but also adrenaline. And both of these will increase insulin resistance, as well as creating a redistribution of your fat more in the belly versus another place. So stress makes you fat in the midsection and less fat in other places. 
It also increases hunger. If you're trying to lose weight and you have this appetite and you're always hungry, good luck. And of course, lack of sleep, stress, spike insulin. So this is at the heart of the problem and I'm just showing you the relationship between what's, what could be triggering these two things. Now, if you notice, I didn't even mention carbohydrates yet, okay? But carbs definitely will increase your insulin, but stress will do it. And also a lack of sleep will do it. All right, now what about this dieting, okay? These repetitive cycles of trying to lose weight and then going off your program and gaining it back and then trying to lose weight and going back in the program. So many people go on a diet to lose weight. And I don't know, for some reason, they might think that that's gonna be then maintained once they lose the weight. But um, I would highly suggest you search out something that is more of a long-term lifestyle change rather than some diet you go on. Because the more times you're doing this dieting on and off, on, off, on, off, Boy, you're training your fat cells to be very, very conservative. You're training your insulin to be very efficient as well. You're training your endocrine system um, to really go at a snail's pace as far as releasing energy. But of course, a lot of this depends on what this diet is. Is it a low calorie, high carb diet? Is it this or where is it that? So that's a big factor. Let's talk about frequent meals. Um, there are some, some diets out there that, that will focus on have smaller portions, okay, and have frequent snacks to prevent hunger. So that way you won't overeat because they're thinking the calories are causing the weight gain, right? So this frequent meal thing, wow, this right here, um, not only do carbs increase insulin, but it's the eating that also increases insulin. So what you're really doing is you're spiking insulin not repetitively. Now, you might not be spiking it at a very, very large amount, but it's a repetitive chronic stimulation of insulin that will just keep you hungry all the time and keep you from ever being able to tap into your fat. I mean, this right here is just going to train your system to become so efficient at holding energy right, and not burning fat. Then we have inactivity, okay? Not exercising. Um, so of course you're burning less calories, right? But it's been found that exercise only is responsible for about 15% of your weight loss. And so that's not the majority. That's just a small portion. Is exercise important? Absolutely. Because not only can it help you burn some calories, but that's a minor thing. It can greatly help you with insulin resistance, okay? We'll get to that in a bit. I already mentioned the carbs. Carbs are the biggest thing that will increase insulin, of course, and sugar, and of course, junk food, right? That has chemicals like MSG, refined carbohydrates can all increase insulin and keep you thoroughly hungry all the time, causing you to have a need for more of this. All right. Now let's just finally answer the question. What's worse for your metabolism? Stress or dieting, or, or let's just say past dieting, okay? Well, it's going to be stress. Let me explain. Being in practice for about three decades, I always would ask a person, when did you start developing a slow metabolism? Or when did you start to find out that, man, it's becoming more difficult to lose weight? It was nearly always after a stress event, okay? Always. So it could be a loss of a loved one, loss of a job, and it could have started after a pregnancy, which is a major stress. Or it could have happened after some sustained stress, a chronic stress situation, going through a divorce, going through relationship problems, dealing with kids, dealing with money, dealing with some other health problem. And I'd really like you to comment down below just to tell me if your weight situation or your weight becoming more stubborn occurred after a stress event and what that stress event was. All right, so stress is really number one. Now, of course, I'm not talking about current stress. I'm talking about past stress, but current stress could also be a huge, huge factor that could be something that you're not really focused on as much. Number two, past dieting. This is another one. Um, you take someone who has been 
told that they were overweight as a small child, but maybe by the parents too. And they, they start you on a diet, you know, when you're a kid, you know, or you start dieting in your teenage years. I found that really slows down your metabolism, especially the type of dieting that they're doing. They're not trying to get the person healthy. They're just putting them on a diet. And usually a physician supervised diet, and hopefully it's not some drug that they're giving this child. But the point is that past dieting really trains your uh, system to become so efficient that now you're stuck with a situation uh, that you need to bend the physical universe to make things go right and go way beyond what an average person will have to do. Frequent eating, that's number three. That's really, that's huge. Um, frequent eating does not stimulate your metabolism. It stimulates insulin, which then will slow down your metabolism to a snail's pace. In fact, if we just, you know, differentiate between number three and number four, carbs and frequent eating, I'm going to say that it's frequent eating that's worse than even the carbs, okay? Because, and I'm not telling you to do this, but if you had carbs and you, you did intermittent fasting, you'd probably lose more weight than if you just ate healthy foods and had frequent meals, okay? I mean, it'd be a good experiment to do. So that's my theory. I could be wrong, but, you know, these are close, but I think it's the frequent eating that's worse. So then, of course, we have going on a low-carb diet and eating healthier quality foods and, of course, getting off the junk food. All right, number five is asleep, okay? So that's important, but not as important as some of these other things. Now, of course, if you handle your stress, which you need to figure that out, then that's going to help your sleep. All right, number six is inactivity or exercising. So if you're trying to think of what to do first, second, third, or fourth, um, it wouldn't necessarily be exercise at the very first thing. Why? Because it only contributes to 15%. However, that being said, if you start exercising, you're going to immediately help produce insulin. But what I'm trying to do is just give you some relative importances, right? What's more important than something else? And I think this will help you. So what do you do? Number one, do whatever you can do to reduce stress. Now I have many, many videos on this and I'm going to put some down below. Okay. But this has to come down uh, and then you're going to sleep better. And just right there, that's going to help you greatly. Number two, intermittent fasting. That is a must. And what's really cool about doing intermittent fasting and of course, at the same time, low carb. But if you feel like you can't do both, if you start with intermittent fasting, you'll get further. Okay. But check this out. When you do fasting and get on a low carb diet, your mood automatically increases. So in other words, you can take someone from depression or anxiety and bring them up. Okay. And guess what that's going to do to your stress? It's going to reduce your stress because your mood is better. Your outlook, your viewpoint is better. You take two people that experience the same stressful event, and one person just has a different way of looking at it because their mood is higher versus someone else. You're going to have much less impact on your body if you just are in a better state of mind. And then, of course, number three, add the exercise in there. That's going to help you with your insulin resistance. But what we're trying to do ultimately is fix this efficiency problem and get your body to waste more energy. So on that note, since stress is number one, you should check out this video on stress right here.